is all about is your right to freedom of speech. What made America great is an independent, vigorous press. If a jerk burns a flag, America is not threatened. Political speech is the heart of the First Amendment. We're expressing their religious beliefs. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all the God's children. Our guests today are the creators of South Park, Matt Stone and Trey Parker, and Larry Dibney, the president and CEO of the show's home, Comedy Central. It's great to have you here. I, uh, we're sitting here at the uh, U.S. Comedy Arts Festival, and I've got this program in my hand. And here we go. Freedom in the Arts, honoring Norman Lear, Gary Trudeau, Oliver Stone, Matt Stone, and Trey Parker. Um, was that pretty much your intent, becoming a living legend in, in free expression here? Is this pretty yeah, heavy company I think here. You like, that, when, you like that picture of us? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, when Matt and I were like 20, I said, Matt, how can we be honored someday? <laughs> For, for anything, and we figured, let's do a cartoon and go that route. So that's, How that's... can I be in the same room with Oliver Stone <laughs> and yeah. not at the Playboy Mansion? <laughs> Where would I be? <laughs> Norman Lear was here uh, earlier and, and talked about how, how much he enjoys your show, and he sits down with a, a nephew, I guess, and he says the bonding experience, and, and it was the highest praise. He said uh, what he felt most positively about your show is that it's evocative, and people talk about it afterwards, and he said that's, that's all he ever hoped for with his programs, and and um, that's that's the highest praise. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, it was really, and it coming from him because we were definitely influenced by him as well. And when we saw, you know, we grew up sort of more with sitcoms like uh, Different Strokes and 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 uh, Hello Facts Larry and Facts of Life. That was that was supposed to be our comedy, you know. And and uh, and so it wasn't until a little bit later that we saw syndicated runs of All in the Family, and we were, you know, really like, wow, this this was what happened to this stuff because it just went away when everything got so PC in the '80s and. Um, you know, you could never have had an Archie Bunker again. And it was really when we started talking about how could you bring an Archie Bunker back, what if you made him a little eight-year-old fat kid that, that really influenced uh, one of our characters, Cartman, in the show, was, it was based on Archie Bunker. And I understand Monty Python was something you did watch that warped you early? Is that yeah, a huge yeah. influence. Monty Python because, you know, as Trey said, all the, all the comedy we grew up with was just so milk toast and just the same. And it was on PBS. They showed Flying Circus on PBS, like on, I think it was Wednesdays or Thursday nights. And I remember like setting up a TV in my room just to watch that. And I really don't think we understood every, we obviously didn't understand a lot of the jokes or a lot of what was going on, but it was just like, what is this? This is new. This makes me like, And as know. a kid, you're intrigued by it. You don't want to be given this, you know, sitcom kind of, you know, like today's sitcoms that's just sort of ring right. the bell humor and everything's so the same. You know, kids want to be like, have this sense of discovery of like, I don't understand what's going on here and I want to know what's going on. <laughs> and that's, you know, watching Python at ages five and six was, in fact, you know, I thought that the way they talked that way because it was funny, not because there was an actual place that they came from. And I finally realized that there was this country that, you know, they, they talk <laughs> like that. I, I figured it out about two years ago. Yeah. <laughs> now, Larry, I have to ask, are these guys a blessing or a curse? Uh, they're both. Um, <laughs> And it's a great, it's a bad, it's not a, they're not a curse at all. I mean, when I first was uh, exposed to South Park, which was the spirit of uh, Christmas, the six minute tape, I was tearing, I was laughing so hard, I thought it was the funniest thing I've ever seen, and turned to uh, Doug Herzog, who was the president at the time, and said, you know, you can't hear this. <laughs> and he says, you never know. So and just for those who haven't seen it, can you describe it, the spirit of Christmas? Well, the spirit, how, maybe you guys should describe it better, but the spirit of Christmas is like Santa and Jesus basically duking it out. Um, and it's a lot deeper than that, but it was the, the, the most irreverent, the, the funniest, groundbreaking use of language and characters in a setting that you've just never seen before. And I thought it was the funniest, funniest thing I've ever seen. And then when we finally put it on the air, uh, we had advertisers, uh, which is, you know, an issue we go around a lot, who wouldn't go near it. But for everyone who wouldn't go near it, there were two who would, and it was a huge success for us. It was kind of like the uranium for the network in, in many ways. Because Comedy Central always looked to do groundbreaking things, and we had always, you know, try, try to break the mold. We do not like to run sitcoms. It's a, it's a network where we try to do something different. Even Ben Stein's Money was a new take on game shows. Every format we did was a new take on that format, usually. This was brand new in its format and its ex and expression and its, and its politic, and it was funny. And it's funny. And the common denominator for us, if it's funny, it works. And it did extremely, extremely well. As we went forward with it, there were issues sometimes about, you know, what they what I would let them say and what they wanted to say, and, and uh, mutually we were able to work every one of them out. Well, you give them a lot of latitude. I want to talk about some of those, but I'm curious, in a, in a PC environment, you've done Spirit of Christmas and Hollywood's talking about it, and and sounds like a short leap to, to finding a home that would embrace you. Was it that easy? No, and in fact, the, the, the biggest thing was <clears throat> the same kind of, of uh, 
and we even questioned the same way Larry did, you know, when, when people were like, we got to make this into a show, because the short actually had the kind of language that the South Park movie had. I mean, it was very, right. you know, very hardcore. And, um, and, and a lot of people said, well, this is really funny, but you'll never get this on TV. But we knew... Or it won't work without... It won't work it won't without that... funny without that language. Without That's the only thing going that, that far. But we knew, you know, it's really all about limitations. We knew that as long as we're on television, we're pushing the television edge, it's okay. Which was why when we made a movie, we knew, okay, now we got to take it time to because now we're pushing the movie edge. If we'd only done South Park the way it's on TV for a movie, it, it, no one would have said, wow, this is really cutting edge, you know. And, and so... So we had the same, you know, we had the same thoughts going into it as, you know, we were questioning it too, but we just knew there was something else there. There was also just the eye candy factor of it. People just liked how it looked, you know, which was a, an interesting thing. <clears throat> but we, and we got courted by a few places that wanted to do the pilot, you know, and um, the thing, what we, we just based it on, Comedy Central had the shows on that we watched, which was they were running Monty Python, they were running Absolutely Fabulous, they were, you know, running um, Kids in the Hall. Mm -hmm. And it was the kind of comedy, the only kind of comedy that we were really into when we knew, you know, we didn't want to take it to MTV and have it become a kid's show, which is, you know, all MTV really is anymore is Nickelodeon. So, you know, that it really wasn't a hard decision. You know, we knew that's... Because they were airing the Pythons that still had that kind of material that was, you know, just as edgy as anything we've ever done, if not edgier. There was a moment when you were ushered into a room, I'm sure, to watch the first, the pilot. What was your gut reaction when you... Brilliant! I thought it was funny, and to me, the, the you know, funny is really the common denominator. You know, you can do a lot of shows that have expression, but it, it, bottom line, it has to be funny. Not only was it funny, you know, it was so unique and groundbreaking, provocative. You know, all the things that are in our quote mission statement. You know, uh, for the network, unique point of view, intelligent, and very, very funny. And, and uh, we looked and immediately knew that we had a hit on our hands. I mean, there was no mistake about it. But what's fascinating is. We went through a, a, a phase of, because then what happened was that the, um, and I don't remember who, what sort of branch it was, but they decided they had to focus, they had to do a focus yeah, group focus on groups. it, you know, which oh, I, we, see, I didn't know that. we there cannot was a focus stand, group. we cannot stand the whole idea, and in fact, when we made the, the South Park movie, huh. we told Paramount, part of our deal is, we do, no, we do not focus group this movie, and they were like, what do you mean? It's the greatest tool, and blah 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 blah. Yeah, but a and lot of producers and directors like it. Wouldn't yeah, you want to focus group it and find out what people want? And we like, don't, because no. somehow it takes sort of the zen of the whole thing away when you're just counting laughs, you know. And so, anyway, they they focus grouped <laughs> it, and and it did not. It tested very poorly. Really, really, really poorly, poorly with women. And really so, poorly with women. Well, that was that's right. And so we had to call. And so Debbie Liebling, the executive at Comedy Central, had to call us and say, guys, you know, it didn't test very well, and. Um, so maybe we're gonna come, we're not, and we're not gonna pick up the show. It was really because we were supposed to go right away. We're not gonna pick up the show, um, but we we want to keep working on it. And so Matt and I and uh, Brian Graydon, who we were producing it with, got T-shirts with a big check minus on it, <laughs> and we walked into this meeting with check minus shirts on. Like guys. You didn't get a check minus. We all got a check minus. Yeah, like that was supposed to make us feel better. Like, we all got a right. check minus. And so what happened was, so Your basically, focus group got a check minus. But to, uh, you know, we had sort of been in Hollywood for about three years at that time, doing pilot, doing things, and so we kind of said, well, here's another one that's just you know not going to work. And so we had an opportunity to go make a movie, this movie Orgasmo, that we got the money for. So we're like, okay, we're going to go make this movie. And they're like, well, what? You, you can't do that. And um, and then finally, a couple months later, they said. Uh, you know what, maybe we will try write another script and we'll see. And we ended up writing the Kathy Lee episode, which it became still, another episode. We wrote that and then, you know, but it was all, again, it, it, if it had been based purely on focus groups and that kind of thing, it would have never been on the air. There are people who would find it hard to believe uh, that, uh, that Comedy Central actually has somebody who controls content, that there are censors at Comedy Central, because you do, you do push the envelope a bit. Uh, who, who, ha who has that job, and what do they do for a living? We have a woman by the name of uh, Renee Presser, um, who has many titles, yeah. uh, depending on who's, who's defining her. Uh, and she works in our uh, legal department, and there's a couple of issues. You know, we, we have a standards and practices department, and it's basically to work with the talent, and we don't have a scripted policy of what is right and wrong, certainly language is is the biggest concern we have uh, and the advertisers are and these guys know this because we debate about this quite a bit the advertisers uh, are, are very cautious to be in certain content and language is is the biggest one that strangely enough it's very hypocritical at times when you look at some of the content that they do support like in daytime soap operas and so forth you know they talk about well I can't be in South Park which is you know so much smarter than anything else that they're in 
So we have to, it's, a, it's an economic balance that we have to maintain. And the Sanderson practice people really, that's not their concern. Their concern is what is this show from an expression standpoint, how is it going to appeal to the viewer? And at the same time, if there is what they think is an advertiser's concern, they'll bring it up to the advertising department. And then sometimes we get into some fights about that. Sometimes. Actually. Sometimes. Like as fight. we speak. Yeah, like right now. Like, like right, right now. after this. It's not a fist fight, usually, <laughs> although we, we may get to that eventually. We don't know. It might get to that with the ad sales guy. <laughs> we we'll get some fresh blood on the floor here right sure, now. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. We have one on right now. <laughs> that they're writing for next week, and we can talk about. It. We should talk about, it, I suppose. Yeah. Which is, you know, there's a spoof on the Subway sandwich thing that was done and with Jared, and with Jared, and, and, and stupid commercials. And and Jared, you know, we get the heads up, so we tell the ad sales guys, and the ad sales guy came and said they cannot do that episode. They cannot. They just <laughs> cannot do it. And I said, well, it's probably down the line. It won't be a problem. Of course, I find out it's next week's episode, <laughs> which is usually the case. See, they corner us a little bit that way. You know, see, there's no chance to move. <laughs> but see, this is, this is to me, yeah, this is a good the one. scariest thing. This it, is honestly, one. the scariest thing. Because here we have, in this, you know, we love USA. We love to talk about our freedom of speech. We love to talk about it and how, what a free country we are. Here we are and we cannot put a show on the air that we want on the air because of a sandwich company, right? <laughs> right. And you've got this big corporation who is dictating what people are going to see and not see, and they don't want people to think badly of their Subway, you know, Subway sandwiches. So this, you know, we can't go on the air saying Subway sandwiches, which to me Well, is you know what? See, we're indicting them. It's really us who are not letting them do it. We haven't even told Subway about this. Right. They're just assuming Subway's going to freak out. We're assuming this is a dynamic, <laughs> right? Now, at the same time, Subway cannot tell us what kind of content we should do in South Park. They don't have to advertise on that show if they don't want to. We talked about this yesterday, and I talked to right. the sales guys about it. We are actually going to go to them. We think they should advertise on it. We think that would be the coolest thing to do. And whether they do or not, uh, probably not. Well, it's uh, one thing. It's also one thing if Subway was an advertiser on South Park and we were doing a show where we were making fun of Subway, I think it would only be responsible for the network to go, hey, you know, by the way, you bought this time during this time we're going to be making fun of you. And I think that's fair enough for them to go, you know what, we're not going to advertise right. that 30 we, minutes. That's right. fine. But what, what bugs us is that we're talking about um, their advertising during other programs on Comedy Central and then they want to control... Yeah, you know something, I, that, or they don't. We, we think they we might think they want do. To. And but we're willing to take this risk, Ken. You know, we are going yeah. to say, go ahead, do the show, call it something else if you would, if, if it doesn't change the creative on it. You know, uh, but we don't want to. You don't want. They don't want to, but they have to. <laughs> See, they have to. <laughs> they have to. that see, censorship. See, the First Amendment doesn't apply there. I guess. Right. Oh, uh, of course. Yeah. The, uh, well, absolutely right. Depends on how you look. You know, they, is the message not getting across that they want to make? I, I feel know? like I feel like. Um, you know, being a being a hardcore capitalist like I am, I feel like it's it's a company's. It, I guess it's their prerogative to do what they want to do with their money. But on the other hand, it's also the an, it's also just to me supremely un-American, and it should be called out every time it's done. And it's done every. I mean, this yeah. is a, yeah. all the networks. So come, this kind of actually, stuff should be out, and, and people should say, people, you know, buyers should say, subways, and you know. We haven't indicted them yet. They haven't said anything. But right. any company that puts that kind of pressure, that's a supremely un-American move, and I'm going to boycott that company because that's what companies listen to. And what, what we also, you know, we don't think that they will pull out, even if we did Subway, if they'd use the name Subway. Right. I think that they would most likely stay on the network because they want to reach the audience. At the same time, advertisers support us very heavily. We, we do a very, very fine business with them, above the market average, and they do buy this content because we do reach the audience that wants this content. And every year it gets better and easier. We have a thing called the Outlist where certain advertisers don't go in certain shows, but every year it gets better and they're on the network more and more. There are some advertisers in the past who would not buy the network, never mind any individual it show, anything. because of what we were. And that is now shifted. And some, some major ones, uh, fast food restaurants that weren't on us before, on us in a big way now. So we've had to educate them about this. And I think we still have an education process to do and saying to them, you know what, the, you know, they're going to practice this because what they're concerned about is they get a letter from their customer and then they right. start boycotting them. They get one or two letters up in the corporate office and then they pass it down and everybody freaks yeah, out. So, so out. where the soul of this really lies, it remains to be seen. And this dynamic has kind of taken on its own. We are even participating in this dynamic to some degree. But we do feel very strongly that we are pushing it more than anybody else, and we will challenge them on this more than anybody else. And I, I knew that language was a problem yeah. on the show, but I never dreamed it was Subway. That that was, that's what's so that fascinating. Yeah, that's what's right. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. language, it issue, be. It the language be. issue, I mean, we sometimes like, oh, come on, can't we say blank, blank? And, yeah, you know, we've obviously pushed the, the envelope with that. You know, we did a whole episode with the, the S word and, uh, and why you can't say it on TV. But, 
that stuff's kind of not that interesting anymore. It's well, no, these but, economic you know, but kind of things. That's thing, a good know? example. They called them and said, we want to do the S word 162 times. And it's very classy of you guys to say the S yeah, word. Yeah, yeah. We don't want to sully your program with the S word. Yes, man, yeah. We're lucky we have an on here. <laughs> uh, but I, w I thought about it, you know, I was not going to do it because of this language right. issue. You know, we can't do that. I said, well, and a sum total of how many times? 162 times. But it was so satirical. It was so smart. It was, how could we not do it? And the advertiser sponsored it. They were, they, yeah. that show was sponsored. And it was really reminiscent. And we got 5,000 emails the next day from the Parents Teachers Council, yeah. my sister-in-law being one of them. Those were negative good. emails, I guess. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> but it's also, I think, one of the, the, sh the defining shows that at least last year kept South Park in the news, kept us... Yeah. You know, as still a, uh, you know, there were a lot of articles at the end of the year that were like South Park is still, a, you know, a cutting edge show, and that's that's what's so hard for Matt and I is I we've got this job after you know almost four years, four and a half years of doing this show, of trying to stay on the edge, mm -hmm. and and we don't want you know South Park to be just sort of tweedle away and become just a cutesy little show, you know, and that's why we'll always do it ourselves, you know, but it's such a challenge to to constantly push it, which is why there is this dynamic, you know. Well, you would never see the Simpsons ripping on Subway sandwiches, ripping on that right. whole, you would just, that, that to me is what, defi what differentiates South Park from a lot of the other shows is that, uh, you know, you can be edgy in many different ways. And one of them is in this way of, oh my God, they have this, they, they, they're even, you know, Subway does commercials on there and here they are taking the piss out of Subway. I was struck though when you said, let us do it, because you guys have got tremendous clout. Um, and, and yet you're not able to sort of carve out a contract that says, you know, we can call any sandwich we want. Uh, no, no, because of these, obviously we can't because no, it's TV, can't. you know. No, they can't. And, you know, and I'll tell you, they're great to work with. I mean, I, you know, I, I would never want to you know, all of a sudden us start leaking the essence of this show by being re too restrictive. And that would, we, we all lose. I think we, we are certainly the network that has gone further than anyone else, but is it really where it should be? No. Yeah. I mean, th there's real capitalistic enterprise answers to a lot of this. Right. We do absolutely continue to challenge this and to push it. Is it where it should be? De jure? No. De yeah. facto, this is how we do and, it. And the First Amendment says Congress shall make no law. It doesn't say Subway shall make right, no exactly, calls yeah, to right. complain yeah. about. Right. And uh, they I, may not, by the way. Subway may be very happy <laughs> with all yeah, this. Yeah, yes. <laughs> you talked about pushing the envelope, and I was struck, though, with the show with 162 references. How much like Lenny Bruce that was, which was, you know, Lenny Bruce mm -hmm. used to use racial epithets over and over and over again and saying it doesn't take mean their anything. Power. Take, at all. take away their power. And, and, you, and you absolutely you know, caught, captured that today. Uh, and yet, if your mission is to sort of push the envelope, to do what others wouldn't do, to find comedy in new and different places, Will you run out? I mean, are, you, are, are there any standards Which left? is exactly why, obviously yeah. now it's not like we can do a show, oh, let's do a show where we say, you know, the F word 162 times, you know, it's like, it's, That'd you've got to look funny. for new ways to do it, but, you know, <laughs> you got to, you, you know. No, but sometimes <laughs> we're, we're, always, we're always fascinated by the, where everyone's like, oh, you're doing this and this is new and this is new, and we're like, well, it, thanks, but there have been a lot of people doing this stuff from, from Norman yeah. Lear with in the family yeah. to Lenny Bruce to George Carlin. I mean, it's not like brand new to say that, you know, when, when Married you know. with Children was on Fox, they had these immense problems with advertisers and people who wouldn't, advertisers wouldn't even be in the show. You know, Married with Children now is a fine, off-net syndicated show that everybody likes. The, the line moves. It continues to move. And I think so, society, you know, where is where the fodder, where these guys go and pluck from, like, you know, what is going on? You, you it's a it. go, but it also kind of goes like this. Because yeah. it, I mean, here, a, a fascinating, yeah. fascinating story is we actually had a show last season where we wanted to say the N-word. Right? No, no, cannot say. No, no, no way can we way. say. Really? So then and we so, just like, mm, so okay, then we, we're we're like fight. okay, how can we do this? <laughs> and we finally got to the point where we could start to say it, and then we had to cut cut away. But basically, you, you know, it, right. it you knew was the character sad. was saying because the, the joke it, it's the joke of the entire show. You thought whole you thought the whole show was about one thing, and then you find out that the very end that Mr. Garrison, the teacher, is just a total racist, and and says this word. And so we argued and argued and argued. And if they We're never going to have the N-word on our network. You'll never, never have it on our network. So last week, Matt's in New York, and he's watching Comedy Central. And like 1 o'clock in the afternoon. 1 o'clock, and they're playing Blazing Saddles. Uh. And the N-word is all over it. And, and not bleeped. bleeped never not, bleeped you know, whatever. And we're just like... <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> See, that, that was really bizarre, though. I, I want to emphasize to the audience at home that, that before we sat down, we said, you can say what you want. So the reference to the F-word, the S-word, and the N-word not imposed by us, no restriction on free expression, they're just being classy, so yeah. <laughs> we appreciate that. No, we know, you know, we've got parents, we know how to talk around mom and dad, you know, <laughs> yeah. how to talk when grandma's in the house. Which are we? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
South Park uh, got an early reaction, but uh, you know, looking back at the clips and the reviews, sometimes it took magazine six months to catch on and to, to write about it with outrage. Yeah. That didn't happen with That's My Bush. It was sort of attacked before it was ever on the air. Uh, and, and, uh, and you were on the hot seat. Yeah, yeah, he was on the hot seat. Hot, hot. Uh, it was fun, actually. What was uh, the idea behind that over. show initially? <laughs> what, what it was, it was a, it was a sitcom, uh, just basically, it was more kind of a, a send-up of sitcoms, but the idea was it's starring George Bush and Laura Bush, and originally the Bush twins in the White House. Because it's, it's your family sitcom. It's your family sitcom. Somewhere along the line, we one of our writers on the show wrote sides, wrote a little scene, um, we were casting, we were casting many different, like, you know, we're seeing what kind of cast we're going to even have. We're going to have, this, we're casting, doing initial casting call for the Bush twins, mm -hmm. the Bush daughters. And he wrote a scene that was pretty over the top. It was about them being like lesbians and stuff. It was all implied. It was pretty stupid. And, but it was only, it was never going to be in the show. It was just for casting purposes to get people. That got leaked to the internet. And then it made like page six or something. Yeah, it some, hit the papers. Some tabloid picked it up and then it just, boom. And it was like, let you know Matt and Trey, lesbian Bush daughters, and uh, yeah. So that was never the intent to. No, no in fact, and I think that then people that if although that's kind of a anyone funny that idea. saw <laughs> the show saw that it was this outrageous show. But again, at the heart of it, we made George this very lovable, very Absolutely. nice guy. We made his wife just you loved her, and we wanted to do the same with the daughter. You know, we wanted this perfect family. That was the whole joke. And the truth is, is you know, uh, two months after we decided and we all got past this and we made the show. You know, they all started getting busted, and they were all over the place. Yeah. You know what I mean? The lesbian thing was a red herring. You would have played them comedically, but absolutely, basically like. But sweet, once that sweet stuff little... gets started, it, you can't control. Actually, it. one of the, the the way she would there was a character on the show named Princess who we, we turned her into a secretary, but um, <clears throat> the daughter we were gonna actually call the daughters not by their real first names. We we're gonna call them Princess and something yeah, else, Muffin or something. But Princess, who ended up on the show, that's how. <clears throat> one of the daughters would have been just lovable. Uh, completely lovable, completely sweet, just a little dingy, mm -hmm. you know. We only have a few minutes left. We have to talk about your adventures in, in motion pictures. Yeah, uh, adventures they have been. And and two movies, your, your two movies, both of them were initially rated NC-17. Right. right. It was Orgasmo, which is a movie that Trey mentioned that we did years ago before South Park was on the air, that we financed independently um, and then um, got picked up by October Films, which was, at the time wasn't owned by Universal, I think it is now. Or, they were, full independent, they were a fully independent company. And we got an NC-17. And we said, okay, well, and at the time we were like, okay, well, what do we need to do? What do we need to And cut? just for the people who are watching this, that means like no one can see it. You can't Basically see it. Basically it means your movie's dead. Yeah. I mean, it, it really does. Because no, well, I mean, that's what it means is no, nobody under 17 allowed, with the parent or not, no right. one allowed. What it really means is no multiplex will carry your movie. There's very few, just independent, you know, theaters. Which is so wrong. I mean, uh, just, just the NC-17 is a ridiculous yes. notion that I, as a parent of my child, if I want to take him to Saving Private right. Ryan and it's NC-17, it's somewhat, some organization can tell me I can't. Yeah. You know, that's my kid, <laughs> you know, and I should be able to, if I want to take him to a movie, I can take him to a movie. Yeah. And, uh, you I'd know, I'd rather but, let my kids see some of that stuff than some of the direct that's rated G and PG. But the MPA is a, a, the scary, and we could go on forever, but, I mean, because um, that's even scarier than, you know, a sandwich company sort of deciding what's on a show. <laughs> and you actually have a shot to negotiate with them. Well, you do only if... This, only this, if you're a signatory. <laughs> but that's the difference between doing an independent movie and a studio movie. When we were doing an independent movie, they wouldn't return our phone calls. Because we were just these little nobodies who had made this million-dollar movie, and, 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 and at the time we were like, well, what can we change to get an R? And they said, well, you know, we gave you an NC-17, and, and we can't tell you what to change because we're not a censorship group. That's what they tell right. you. Like, you are, <laughs> you, you know, and, and they're like, well, so we can't give you any specifics. And so then you have to go and do a, a thing where you go and basically get on your hands and knees and beg them. So I went in there and I'm all, you know, just, just and, and, and there's these, you know, 80 year old people all staring down at me. And I'm like, <laughs> look, there's no nudity in this film. There's no sex in this film. It's all just language that you're giving this an NC-17 for. And, and I was, you know, just ma stated my case. I'm like, okay, well, thank you. Step outside, and we'll tell you what we think. Step outside. And, <laughs> and literally, I didn't even get the chance to close the door before the guy comes out and goes, it's still an NC-17. And we're like, can we try again? No. It's just, you can, but it costs. And you've got to do another Avid cut. You've got, you know, it's, it's so cost prohibitive. And so then the fascinating thing is we do the South Park movie. And that, from the beginning, is with Paramount Pictures, right? So the MPA gets a cut way before the movie's even done. And we get a call from the studio going, so the MPA think, you know, you need to take this out, this out, and that out. 
And we're like, wait we had a minute. very specific notes. Wait a minute. Uh-huh. They wouldn't do this when and we they, were, yeah. at, at, you know, they wouldn't. And uh, I thought they were in a censorship group. And, um, and there was this whole process of the studio working with the MPAA to get that R and them give and take and give and take and give and take. That is so frightening because it was only because it was a big studio movie when I was just a filmmaker, you know, when we were just filmmakers on our own trying to do this. Exactly. They exactly. I, the I know that the NBA is illegal. Mm. I know it is. I know if someone was a challenge on legal grounds, it's basically a cartel basically setting up rules. The big guys get to set up the rules that even the little guys have to follow, but they have no say. What did you have to lose to get South Park? The well, we ended up. We ended up. Every time they said cut this, we would put something back in that was worse. <laughs> Honestly, they made the movie worse. There's no yeah. question. They and made that movie raunchier and raunchier. Yeah. But here's the fasc- and here's the fascinating thing. <laughs> here's what it all came down to. So now we're a week away. We're a week away from the movie coming out, and it's still an NC-17. You know, we've done this give and take, but we really kept just making it worse and worse because they just made us angry. And um, finally, Scott Rudin, the producer. No, we, there was Paramount. one joke, I can't remember what it was, and we called up and said, we are not cutting this joke. Yeah. I don't care what, you can... It's just going to be an NC-17, so too be, bad. And it's and a then week Scott away. Rudin, and he's like, okay, I'll call Scott Rudin called somebody, probably Sherry Lansing, she called somebody else, and the next day the movie was an R, and not a frame of it changed. Yeah. So It was it wasn't just Paramount about Pictures it was basically about finally telling the MPAA, you really need to make this an R, and they're like, okay, it's an R. Fascinating. <laughs> That's <laughs> disgusting. There was a time in this country where government was sort of leaning on creators and now all the pressure comes from I'd be less like scared that. of government because I'd be, be less accountable scared of because we could vote them out exactly and MPA is just there it's like star chamber <laughs> <laughs> great conversation thank you so much cool. for joining us today appreciate it join us next time as we continue our discussion on free expression and the arts for more information about Speaking Freely, visit our website at www.speakingfreely.org.